I'm fantasy and romance author Leslie Penelope, and this is Imagining Success, an interview series where I talk to authors who have achieved career milestones that others only dream about, and ask them how they got there and where they go from here. Today, I talked to Fenderson Jelly Clark, author of the novels A Beanie Song and A Master of Gin, as well as novellas and short stories, too numerous to mention. He's a multiple award winner, having taken home Nebula, Locus, Ignite, and British Fantasy Awards, and having been nominated multiple times for just about every other award the genre has to offer. We get to talk about the industry, shifting ideas of success, and something all Gen Xers should know, why reading is fundamental. He was one of the first people I thought about when I was putting together this interview series, and I'm so happy to share our conversation. Before publishing, why did you start writing in the first place? Oh, that's a good one. I think I, I first started writing um, because I read a lot. <laughs> and I, I don't know if this is for everyone, but I know a lot of people who write, they'll say this. They wrote a lot, and then one day they were like, I want to write something too. And so for me, it started like, young. I was a, I was a kid and I read so much and I was just so interested in it. And, you know, without even knowing things like three part structures or anything like that, or plotter pacing, I'm just mimicking what I've seen. Cause I've just, I've just picked it up. And so I would write, you know, little short stories, you know, the stuff for school, but then for friends, I would make little mm-hmm. comic books for my sister and family that I could clip together these little books. And so I think I was doing that for a long time, even to the point where, as I got much older in high school um, and early college, I find myself still a voracious reader and still doing little stories or things on the side. But I got to say, in all that time, yeah, I never thought of like, oh, this stuff is going to be something I do and people will pay me for it. And more people than my friends or who I'm dating at the time or my family are going to read it. I don't think I actually thought of that until after college, to be honest. So in the beginning, it was, it was just because I just I just liked it because I had an interest in reading so much. Mm-hmm. So what was the leap between writing and loving writing and then deciding other people really need to read this and pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, in the beginning, the leap was just, was at some point, um, I would say after college, when you've like, okay, I've done the college thing and I hadn't decided to go to grad school yet. I was kind of <laughs> in limbo. Um, I think I just, you know, it's just like it turned on. I said, hey, what if I took my hand at actually writing a book, like a book that other people want to read? And, you know, part of it was, you know, the issue of diversity. I love these books, but I just didn't see myself. I mean, I love fantasy, for instance. I just didn't see that much of myself in fantasy. I didn't even know of um, Imaro novels. Charles mm-hmm. Saunders, I didn't even know of Charles Saunders. His stuff had gone out of wow. print. So he didn't even enter my sphere. I, I think I knew like a, maybe a book or two by Octavia Butler, but you as a fantasy writer, you know, this wasn't fantasy, right? Of the secondary world, full on fantasy. People who grew up, you know, me growing up reading Robert Jordan and Tolkien and all these people. And so I think I at first, you know, then I was, you know, going through my Afrocentric phase. I had to do like a fantasy, you know, I had to bring, I had to bridge it, right? I had to give myself a a fantasy novel set in an African type setting Mm -hmm. uh, using African languages and culture. And that's what I wanted to do. And I think that drove me a lot in in the beginning. Okay. So then you decided that you were going to public write for other people. What was your... What did success mean to you? Like when you're like, were you querying and what, what were your goals and your hopes? Wait, okay. So let's first step and back up. Let's, uh, so this is important to say the spark and the drive was there. The passion was there. The understanding of industry and how it works was absolutely not. It was another country, another planet. Uh, mm-hmm. What I had that was great was just to drive to write creativity. Let me show you how terrible it was when I would first write my short stories I didn't understand how long a short story had to be, even though I'd read them. I would finish a short story at 30 something thousand words, <laughs> right? It's it's unpublishable. I, I don't know. I know nothing about the market. I don't know anything about querying, um, submitting. I don't know anything about getting agents and how any of that worked. Uh, in the beginning, it was just me running on this pure passion and drive to do it. 
but also, I mean, quite blunt, a lot of ignorance, mm -hmm. <laughs> not knowing yeah. that industry at all. And so it was really a ways into that, that I had to kind of learn about the industry. And that took years. That took years for me to realize I needed to learn about it. <laughs> right? It was a few years of me churning out things and then being, okay, what do I do with it? Now that I have it, I figure somebody's just going to come and get it, right? Success to me looked <laughs> like somebody would just come get these books. I'd be published. I was thought like, and I'll be, you know, nobody's doing this African fantasy stuff. I don't know, Charles Saunders did it, didn't know at the time. Uh, there were probably... One million other Black people who were reading this stuff who also had all of the same ideas I did, and it was just I it was almost this this hubris that well it hasn't happened because I haven't <laughs> done it yet. Not like no, my friend. Uh, many people have tried this, and uh, the industry is hard to break into. There are all kinds of barriers and structural and systemic that deal with a lot of issues. Why the kind of thing you're trying to do has not been published yet, and so. I say all this to say that it took like th there was this long period of just passion and drive. And then there was this hitting this wall and uh, finally getting educated on things. And mm -hmm. that was when success to me became more tempered. Right. Mm -hmm. When I understood, OK, success is not getting this massive three tome fantasy novel <laughs> published. It's maybe. Uh, can I get some short stories in paying markets? Mm -hmm. I finally figured out that it was a thing called SIFWA and <laughs> that it was important. I had no idea. Right. And like, oh, I, maybe, maybe that success is getting, you know, into that. And then from there building towards, maybe I can get a book published. I started learning, you know, first book publishers, maybe 120,000 words, what you're looking for. And so it, it, it went from, I would say like just pie in the sky because I had no idea how the industry works that I would just show mm -hmm. up and people would just, here's, here's my books, take them <laughs> <laughs> to reality of a much more modest step-by-step -step process. Uh, okay. yeah. And so, cause you did a lot of short stories and the novellas before you did a novel. Mm -hmm. And so you really took that, I guess, to heart. Was it, it was, was strategy. it strategic? <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> It was a strategy. So my story, just to give a, a, a make it brief. Uh, I had a massive fantasy tome that I thought I would get published. Of course, it was some kind of Egyptotic, you know, Nubian. Uh, of course, yeah. I told you, Afrocentric day. A total Nubian. hotep, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we're all, we're all we were all recovering hoteps in some ways. Hey, it's still it's helped inform a lot of stuff. But you know, you know, I have an aunt tattoo also. <laughs> Pardon. I said I have an Ankh tattoo also. So yeah, I've, I've been I, there. I have my I, I have my Akan on one side and uh, I have Heru on the other somewhere. So in the beginning, when I was when I was first doing this, that fantasy tome, I won't, it didn't almost. Well, let's say it went up there, and I, I kind of fell backwards into luck. I got an agent who had been Bell Hooks' agent, <laughs> and that wasn't through me querying. It was through. Really, the dumb luck of, oh, I have this book and the right person saw it and they talked to a person or talked to a person. They liked it. But this person mm -hmm. had no idea how to sell this thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I had no idea. There w this was not a time. This was a time when I think the Lord of the Rings movies were out. But there was nobody like I don't even think N.K. Jemison or others had popped on the scene yet. Right. To be like, right. this is kind of. And so literally it went up at this black imprint of a larger company and they all liked it, but they had no, they quote unquote told me we have to pass. We have no idea how to market black fantasy. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And that was like my wake up call. Like, oh, this is, there's all these other things. There's politics and all these other yeah. things. And that's when I think coming from that was when I decided, okay, I need to be more strategic here. I can't just think this is going, I'm going to luck my way into this. People, mm -hmm. you know, the industry is difficult and it's complex. And that's when I started really short stories bit by bit. Right. Um, okay. After nursing my wounds and sulking a bit and getting over myself, I started right. that strategy. And yeah, the, the strategy paid off. It took a long time. The strategy was like, I mean, at least for I call it the time I got serious. I think mm -hmm. by the time I got serious, the strategy took at least eight years before I think I saw like, OK, um, my first wow. big story, which was a tour. Right. Uh, in 2016. Yeah. And so 
you had this really long game, I guess. At the end of it. I didn't want what... it to be a game, by the way. I didn't want it to be a long game. <laughs> I wanted everybody else's great, like, first debut book, put it out there, boom, deal. Mm-hmm. I, I did not want it to be a long game, but it was. It ended up being a long game. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, publishing the short stories, was that just a way to get into longer form? Was that, I mean, was it purely strategic? Well, no, I don't, I don't think it was purely strategic. Partly it was after that whole thing happened with the unnamed fantasy novel, which is now buried deep, deep in the recess and no one will likely ever see ever again. Um, it was, you know, I walked there, that was like psychically damaging. I didn't know if I was going to write again. Right? I was I was that dramatic. <laughs> right? I was like, oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to do this thing. And it was me kind of like, you know, get over yourself. Like, a lot of people have tried this. This is this is the reality. This is how mm-hmm. it's not easy. And so part of the short story writing was pulling myself to get back into it. Yeah. Um, jogging my imagination. You know, it's one of those things where you work on one series and I suddenly found that that was all I had done for a long time period. But what yeah. else do I have of interest? Um, training myself, really honing the craft, right? Understanding that writing is about becoming a better writer. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are things you pick up from, of course, from all the reading, but you pick up some bad, bad tropes as well and bad habits. And so it was just me um, honing my craft and trying to find my voice. Right. Uh, So that I'm not sounding like the other people I'm copying or what have you. And so, no, that short story writing time was, I think, really instrumental in just jogging my imagination getting the discipline to sit down and just turn out a short story, understanding how to craft a short story, how that's different from thinking of a novella or a novelette. Um, And then just, you know, understanding the craft of writing itself, just writing until I thought it got better and better. Mm -hmm. Understanding the market as well, learning, learning the larger science fiction sphere. I said, as a black sci-fi writer, I was on these black sci-fi spaces and they were great and nurturing And they were wonderful in that sense, but they were completely divorced from the larger science fiction world where all those awards and where that money (laughs) is and everything else, you know, and that's good and bad. It was good to have those spaces where I could, I could, I didn't have to explain why I use dialect or something of the sort. And we were bouncing off of each other and I even got to do some indie stuff there. But, you know, then I got published in one of these markets and I was like, you're going to give me a check? For this one, I can give you right? Or I didn't, and again, this is what Sifwe is. And so it was, it was in part also to learn that other world and mm-hmm. to become more experienced in it, right? And um, yeah, that helped. So, okay, right now, what, how would you define success? What does success mean for you at the point in your career where you're at? Um, <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Success to me is, I suppose the ability to write the things I want to write, uh, to take even like of things I think that in the back of my head, I'm like, that's absolutely insane. Like nobody's going to publish this. Success is the ability to pitch that successfully and um, get it, get it out there and done. Um, Success for me, oddly, is figuring out my time management of how to do this with family and everything else. And so the very nature of success has changed. I mean, I, I got the novel published. Yeah, there's. I'd love to like do the big fantasy tome thing one day, but how does that how does that fit into my academic life? How does that fit into my family life? And so, you know, before it was just like I just want to be published, and now it's like, well, how can I be published? And it doesn't. It's not like eating away at all these other parts of my life that I can integrate it well into my. So that's like my number one thing about success now is is less like the. Landing a deal because I landed a deal. I got the publisher. Right. I got the agent. <laughs> right. It's much more. How can I make this balance uh, so that it works? So that writing is enjoyable and it doesn't become a chore. Mm-hmm. Right. That I can still find joy when I'm writing and it's not. Oh, I got to get this. It's got to get this thing done, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you find yourself setting? these like external goals, like monetary goals. I want this kind of deal or I want this sort of extra rights, you know? I wish I did. 
<laughs> one of the, so it's funny. One of the reasons I toyed with being an indie uh, publisher for a while, and you know, I have good friends who have uh, fellow colleagues like Milton Davis, for instance, prolific in his indie. Like some of my first stories. In fact, there's a whole story of how Charles Saunders published my. He and Milton Davis and Charles Saunders published my first short story after the incident and where I wasn't going to write again. That pretty much brought me back to writing. Right. And so I thought about it, but then I saw all the work and I was like, I am terrible at marketing. I am not going to be like the things you're talking about there, the rights. I'm just, it's just not going to be in my head. It's just, I'm not going to do it. Right. I'm just so everywhere else. And so all this to say, I don't, I probably should, (laughs) but I kind of leave it up to the fact that I trust my agent and the people around me. And so they're the ones who often like, make sure you have your rights. And if you're going to do film, we're like, let's make sure. And they're like, you know, sending out numbers. I mean, the first time, like I had my agent negotiate my first contract when I had my agent with tour. And it was really funny because, you know, everybody comes in a low ball and I was like, well, that mm-hmm. sounds good. And he's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't. And he gets like three times more. And I was like, this is why you have agents, right? right? You guys know what you're doing. And some people know that some people individually, they can know that. I'm, that's just not me. I know what my strengths mm-hmm. are. That's not yeah. it, right. And so I am, I, I wish I was setting myself on those business sides deal, but it's more so I'm going to get the people who I understand know the business <laughs> and mm-hmm. I want them to, <clears throat> you know, handle a lot of that. And I delegate it to them and you know, I oversee and I watch and I'll ask questions, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not jumping into, into that stuff. I'm, I'm not Jay-Z trying to get my master's and all, <laughs> doing all that so be the mogul. Yeah. <laughs> so creatively, do you have the sense that there's there's stories that you were meant to tell or that creatively you're, you're always trying to push yourself in certain directions? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's really funny. So my first love, like I, I've said it here, is fantasy. It mm-hmm. is, it's the kind of fantasy you've written. It's the, it's secondary world, fully fantasy, right? Um, but the ones, the books that I have published, as you know, the, most people know me, know like this alternate world and right. these stories are a lot of, and at times meaning and exploring. It's like, well, those are the ones I got published, <laughs> right? Like, I love that stuff. Yes. But, you know, I was like, I wrote recently, I said, my comfort food is a good secondary world. I want to be on a completely different place. I don't want it to have any relationship to this world. I just want something completely different. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying to get into that. I did it with middle Mm -hmm. grade with the Benny song recently, secondary world. Um, and I'd like to do that, uh, more, uh, as I can, but at the same time, I still have all these, you know, I would say closer to ring shout or black God's drums type ideas in my head. I have one, like you said, for 10 years, it's been rattling around my head for at least not 10, but about three years. And I just haven't had the time to do it, but I, I want to do it so badly. And it's, you know, it's a it's a story that pulls on our histories and everything else, but it brings in magic, weird, weird horror and everything and all that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, it's funny you have this. I'm always wondering, like, what if I just run out of ideas? <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Do you do that? Do you have the same problem? Like, I might just I have- run out of ideas one day. Notebooks full of ideas that I will never live long enough to write. (laughs) That's how it is. I have the fear, but then something new pops up and something new comes in. And it's like, what do I have time? And for me, I know there are always there are always new projects. Whenever I hear of like these much older writing, they've had like we've had 40 novels. I'm like, 40 novels. (laughs) Get out of here. Like how? But you know, uh, you know, my wife asked me the other day, she's like, Do you think you're right? Do you think there's a time you'll stop writing? And I said, that's a good question. Is there a time I'm going to be like, like I've written enough. <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I just don't feel like writing anymore. I said, I don't know. Um, so right now, my, my main thing is just, if I'm challenging myself, it's to get the things that I have contracted off my plate and mm-hmm. then seeing what's next. Especially when you write a book and people are like, is there going to be a second one? And I was like, ah. It's supposed to be a standalone. You want a second one? You know the deal. Yeah, that happens to it me. I'm like, it's a stand standalone. Alone. <laughs> right. Standalone story. Now it's a no, now it was a novella, another short story, and now a novel, right? And people want more. And so my biggest challenge, if I would say anything, it's in when people ask that is to decide, is this really a standalone or is there actually more here? Do I have mm-hmm. to actually go back and answer some of those, 
you, when you do a standalone, you know, you take questions or you take paths. You're like, I ain't never got to answer that. <laughs> it's just weird. Like, I go back, I actually have to come up with something, a way to answer that. And so I think that's probably going to be um, my challenge going forward once I get out of some of these contracts. For instance, doing this middle grade, talk about a challenge. The kids grow quickly. And this has been oh, challenging yeah. that you write one book, then the next one has to be written and the next one. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess I'm getting challenged in my own way by taking on some of these projects. Uh, right. To see what comes next. So do you think about the market when you are coming up with new projects? It's like, okay, I sold this one. This world did really well. Maybe yeah. I stay in that vein instead of going into my epic fantasy that I, I've always dreamed of. You know, I, I won't say that I don't. Um, but the way you put it, first, I thought you meant, do I like try to see what the market what's in right now and so forth. Yeah. That, I, that I don't think I do. I, I know I never do like what's, because I mean, by the time you get a book published, like it's like when Ring Shout came out, it came out during that summer after the George Floyd protests. You know, mm-hmm. I get these questions like, so would the George Flo- Floyd protests uh, inspire? I said, do you know how books work? <laughs> 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 that book was written like a year before it, oh, yeah. before it if, if it came out then, it was written a long time ago. And so I all this to say that I always tell people, like, of course, pull from the real world, but don't don't try to fit whatever is the niche, because by the time your book is published, that niche could be out the door. Go for what if if you like that niche and you really want to do it and it brings you joy, then do it. But don't do it just because, you know, the market says. And so but you weren't asking that. anyway. But you were more so asking about my own books. Like if I see that people um, people really like this, should I do more? Yeah, I think about it. Certainly. I think, again, Mm -hmm. that's why. A Digit in Cairo didn't remain just a short story. I had mm-hmm. other ideas. Um, a Benny song, for instance, was before that. Um, but I saw that, okay, people like this. Maybe I should do more. And that really pulled me uh, to do more, um, which I think is, which I think, I, I don't know, For I always, I always wonder if that's normal for most writers, that mm-hmm. what's, nothing feeds our muse than praise. <laughs> and so the things so. that we get praised a lot for I'm either like, man, do I want to not do anything else in it because I don't want to mess it up? Like I'll mess up the second season of the show. Or is this a cue for me to do more if people are self- telling me I like this, right? And so I think mm-hmm. it's it's always a choice. It's always a decision of whether to go on to the new thing or perhaps there's something more here that uh, I can do. Yeah, I think it's a balance because especially on the indie author side, mm-hmm. there are plenty of authors who can feel almost controlled by their readers if they have incredible success with right. something and that's what the readers demand. And then it's like, yeah. I have to stay in this lane. Anytime I deviate the market, you know, the market does not uh, reward that. Oh yeah. Then you go like, read yourself. So, oh, well, you know, I liked him when he did this thing. Yeah. Well, no, I see he's doing this now. Like, I, I mean, I don't go read my reviews a lot, but I, I'll like stumble upon something on Instagram and it'll be like, <laughs> I like it when just when he does all the history and I was like, yeah, it's not the only thing I'm going to do. But I'm going right? to do other stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, I just kind of defiantly like do what, random different things. So I have the epic yeah. fantasy and historical fantasy, and then I have the future dystopian. And like, yeah. I want to keep it different because I will get incredibly bored <laughs> if point. I'm doing yeah. the same thing. But it's probably not the best business decision. I mean, business is like stay in this lane and you can make money in this lane. And yeah. I mean, and, so you know, yeah, I, I see that point. But, you know, I do wonder, um, like I do like – for Benny's song, it's 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 three. So I'm getting the practice of that. It's three novels, okay. right? Yeah. Like, what if this was something like, and I've seen people like you're right, have a main success where this is the twelfth book, right, mm-hmm. in the series, and it's a loyal fan base that keeps coming by. And talk about a challenge. I don't know if I could do something like that. I don't know if I could do like a Nancy Drew, like constantly, <laughs> constantly, constantly. It's like I don't know. After a while, it would seem like the characters to me would just start running together. And I, I would think I would start disliking characters after a while. Right. right? I yeah. think of misery where you just, I just want to kill the characters off after a while. Right. And so I don't, that's, that's a good point you make about wanting uh, something different. Cause in some ways I think it goes back to your challenge thing. Those are ways to challenge yourself. I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I've never done, I don't do science fiction. Mm-hmm. Right. I think I've written one science fiction story. And so, would I go into science fiction or take try my hand at it? I don't know, but that's a yeah. good point. I think, I think we, I think it's it's that it's it's you have to make that choice, right, between what 
the market wants, which is what your your readers want, which is not mm-hmm. a bad thing. If I say the readers, it makes it sound less. <laughs> if I say the market, it's what the market. readers say they want, and um, yeah, doing that, and you're like, no, I have this new thing to offer. And so, for my recent novella, uh, Dead Cat Tail Assassins, um, like someone's like, I didn't think he did fantasy, and I was like, oh, that's, little do you know, that's like my number one thing is secondary world fantasy they thought it was more so altered history and oh, urban yeah. fantasy and you know and i was like no i wanted a completely dungeon and dragons type other world mm-hmm. right and so we'll see how people take it right are they like oh no i want him to do i want more ring shout black gods drums type stuff <laughs> or are they going to accept this completely different world yeah and there's an idea that you can cultivate a readership that will, at least a portion of them, that will like whatever you do because they like yeah. your voice. They like yeah. what you're doing, whatever comes out of your head. Right. Like I've tried, I've um, done a long time ago, a survey of my readers. It's like, mm-hmm. what do you want me to write, write next? Because that's big in the indie world. And they're like, whatever you want. And I'm like, that's great. I appreciate that's what you want to hear, it. yeah. And I think, I, think I do have, yeah, I think I do. I have readers who have read Ring Shout, then they'll also read a Benny song. Even though it's a middle grade book, they'll read it a crossover mm-hmm. as an adult. And I say, that's great that you just, and I'm that way with certain people, like like Neil Gaiman, right? Like mm-hmm. I love Neil Gaiman and Neil Gaiman writing an encyclopedia. If he <laughs> narrates it, then I will listen to him. If you ever listen to he narrates a lot of his books, yes, I will listen to him narrate it because he's the British nanny I never had, right? <laughs> so I will simply listen to him narrate an right. encyclopedia. But yeah, somebody like that. So are there are there career milestones? You don't necessarily have to share if you don't want to, but do you have like secret career milestones that you're like, ooh, you're almost afraid to no. tell yourself? Yeah. The thing is, so I kind of, I had it, which was get a novel published. <laughs> so, because <laughs> the novella stuff was just kind of accidental. Nobody was publishing novellas, novelettes. Mm-hmm. You, you kept those to yourself and that was it. And then Tor comes along and was like, we're going to do novellas. And in like, you know, 2000, uh, 16, 17 or so. And so, boom, now I'm publishing novellas. And so my first actual novel was uh, A Master of Jit. And so I was like, okay, I did it, right? All right, so that's the thing I was chasing all this time, right, to get that novel done and I've done it. It's like, okay. I mean, I would say the awards thing, but the awards thing is still weird and surreal to me. I like, I didn't know what many of those awards were until I got nominated. (laughs) <laughs> for them. I mean, that's how, and I'm being serious, that's how it was being this Black writer who was just outside those spaces. I was into sci-fi, but I was not into the world. I still have never gone to one of those awards shows. I've always done them virtually, right? Yeah. And they were like, you want to go to Nebula? You're not me. I was like, ah. it's like I got kids. <laughs> you know, my kids got to do something, a game. I can't, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's still a surreal world to me. So that's never been my measure. I mean, I'm happy. I'm thankful they're back there, but that that wasn't my measure of a milestone. My milestone was always getting published. And so the novel kind of did it. So you're right. I've kind of been searching, like, mm. what is the next thing? Is it me saying, mm. I want to finally do my, I used to call it um, peak white guy fantasy tome where I can write like a Steven Erickson, Robert Jordan, you know, 12 books, 800 pages each. Is, is that what I want to do? But when I think about that, as much as I love reading that, I realize like my eyes glaze over. I'm like, I could I would <laughs> sustain that. Like, I don't know if I could, I could literally live a life and do that. And so, you know, my milestones have changed. My milestones now are more so get this next thing done so I can get the next mm-hmm. thing done. Right? Okay. It's me keeping something on the tape, on the plate, so that when this thing is done, like I told you, the idea in my head. I have like two novella ideas and I want to just get rid of the stuff I have now so I could jump on those and then seeing what, what happens next, come up, come up with the next idea. Some of that might be shiny object syndrome. It's like the book you will write is always better than the book you are writing. It is the meme of the guy walking with the girl, looking at the, all the time, all the time. Definitely. Yeah. And just a plug for your epic fantasy. There was on Twitter, when it was Twitter, a couple of years ago, somebody put out a call for adult, okay, black adult fantasy of longer than three books. Okay. And the only two theories that anybody could find was mine, which is four books, mm. and Evan Winters, which will be four books, but yeah. it's not complete. There's no other 
adult fantasy long series wow. that we it's can longer than four. Well, there you it's go. longer than three books. Yeah, it's longer than a trilogy. I thought maybe Marlon James might. I don't know how much more he's doing in his. Are there? I think there's three, right? I think there's, there's two, or is he having a third? I don't know. I oh, mean, I don't know. Two. There might be a third. Yeah. You're right. Wow, look at you. You're you're in real company there, but that's that's true. I'm just I mean, saying that yeah, the world needs your epic Especially like a high fantasy, like a complex right. fantasy world with different people. I'm trying, yeah, most at least go for a trilogy like N.K. Jemison has, but yeah, that's Yeah, that's and David point. Anthony Durham had a trilogy. So never, now, now you give my goal, now I got to do my 12, 800 pages. At, at least four or maybe five. You should beat us. Make, make Do but five. I, to reach peak white guy fantasy tone level, that's that, It has that, to be like a lot. dozen. A baker's dozen. <laughs> yeah, like Brandon Sanderson level. I don't know. That's that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We should we should take it. Consider it. Consider it. Like yeah. I don't know if I can do more should than four, four So it's really funny. Back in the day when you were trying we were trying to get published, like, you know, fellow writer of mine, Troy Wiggins, our big thing was like, we need to get published in Beneath Cecil's skies. It was like, you mm-hmm. know, the fantasy market. We love their yeah. stories. And so for the longest, it was like you had these goals for the longest time. Okay, I need to break into a pro market. And that was the pro market. We were both like, if we can do this, we know we've kind of made it. <laughs> right? If we don't, that, this is a goal we set for ourselves. And yeah. we kept pushing and pushing. And we both finally got published there. And then it was done. You're like, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, now what? And I think that's that's the kind of the situation you get in. You're like, okay, I got that thing. I did it. Now mm-hmm. what? What's my what's right. the next thing? Yeah. What's the next thing? Yeah. And that's, that is really tough. And I guess, you know, I'm searching for someone who has an answer to help me because I'm there too. It's like you set these goals and goal creep feels kind of bad. It's like, I want to be able to appreciate this thing that I never thought I'd be able to do. And I do appreciate it, but now I've done it. And so what is next? next. And I I push it further and you want more, but then it feels like, I just want more and more and more. And it feels like greed. And what's the the balance between setting goals and achieving them and just greed, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to, like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very, that's a really good question. Like, you know, like the middle grade thing, that was my big challenge. And like, what comes after that? Um, mm-hmm. Do I did go back to some of the worlds I have, create new ones that I have in my head? I don't know. And then yeah. there's a worry that y- you take so long to go back to the new worlds. People are like, you wrote that win? You want me to go back and read the second one? You're like, you're like right. the Fuji's kind of coming back on a world tour. You had your chance. <laughs> Too much time has passed, <laughs> right? Or like whenever, whenever George Martin, if he ever releases the next book, it's like it's, it's like been I, I, I keep debating. Will I even read it? I was really into his books when I was reading it before the series right. was out, but now that the series made its own version, I'm like, right. yeah, you're right. Like I was like, am I really going to go back and read that? Or I'm just going to be like, eh, mm-hmm. okay. Some of the yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's George yeah. Kirsten. I think I think George probably has to- super success in the sense George is the shiny object. I'm going to write all these other books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> writing that one. I don't, I, I don't know if we will ever really see that book. I, I don't. I wouldn't put too much hope right now on it. We may never. Yeah, I wonder what the odds. The odds are if there's a, a bet there's running. A betting market. Some... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there is. Yeah. Hey. And that's my thing, like writers is writers, just like musicians. I remember um, Tully Pulley had an album way a long time ago, and it was uh, uh, before he spent a lot of time on on Twitter <laughs> and, and Instagram, uh, arguing with people, arguing with some people who need to be argued with, uh, and maybe some people who don't. Uh, he had a, he, on one of his albums, he had a bit about how people were saying, hey, I know you like, you did this thing, but what about this song? What about this? And, he, and it was just, it, I guess what he's trying to say was, as an artist, I do have a right to create what I want. And it's, you guys can't dictate to me what I'm going to write, like you were saying with the indie market. But people would yeah. just constantly tell him like, hey, yeah, like I want to see, I want to hear a song like this, or why don't you do another song <laughs> with most? And he'd be like, yeah, keep it coming, but I'm still going to do what I want to do. Right. And I guess I'm, I'm kind of caught in that, in that bit mm-hmm. where, um, as you said, it's like, am I, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do as mm-hmm. opposed to maybe what a lot of people want me to do. And perhaps the two come together, right? Yeah. But, you know, maybe, maybe even the, the thing that will not be named uh, a project that never went anywhere. Do I want to look back on that? Do I, you know, it's like some things, I, some things I retire to the abyss. 
because I go back mm -hmm. and read them. I go, oh yeah, that was a long time ago. I don't write like this anymore. My thoughts <laughs> don't work like this anymore. This is terrible. And then there are other things that I do wonder if I take them back out and I put like a new eye to them. Do I still like the story? Can I still shape it in a way that I want it to be? Can I bring my new skills to it? Right. And so mm -hmm. if there's, if there's ever, I don't know if it's a goal, but it's always this distant glimmer, right? In the yeah. back. And like when I've probably felt like, okay, I've done enough other stuff. Will I turn back to that uh, and, you know, try to turn it into my magnum opus in some ways? I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes those books are pressure. Like I, I have, I always say I've never, I don't believe I've put anything into the abyss. Like they're, they're in the trunk, but I'm, I'm always willing to pull them out of the trunk if, if inspiration, yeah. <laughs> inspiration comes. Cause I don't want to abandon any of them. I feel very bad about all the books that I haven't finished. And I do, I periodically take them out. I look at them, I'll work on them for a few weeks and then deadline will come. So then I'll put them back in the trunk. Yeah. But like that kind of, I don't know. I just, I don't want to let go of anything. I mean, I'm a hoarder in training. I'm a book yeah. hoarder, I'm an idea hoarder. <laughs> I like what you say about you don't you don't like to you feel like you're abandoning the books right like yeah. they're like so we weren't good enough for you <laughs> right yeah, yeah. and, and I, some of them I mean yeah. what I have done I don't know if you've done this I've cannibalized some of those books unfortunately like um, there are certain ideas or tropes and I was like oh this is gonna go good in here <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> just and I've I kind of that. and like like I was like I don't know if I could ever publish the book now because I obviously took like a main idea <laughs> or beastie or something and I pull them into this one because I just, I liked it so much. Right. And right. so, yeah, that, yeah. I, when I, but there are some things I retired completely. To do this. <laughs> so those yeah. are my earlier, more didactic uh, uh, works, which I don't know would, would fit in this current age. Yeah. So what keeps you writing now? Like you've got a lot of, you've accomplished those goals, right? So what is the engine that keeps you running or the fuel um, that keeps your engine running? Sure. Uh, legal contracts, <laughs> legally binding contracts is let's be real. When you get the deal, people, like I said, that's what people want success. Success is you gotten this deal. And if you've taken an advance, people have given you some money mm -hmm. and now you have to give them something. Right. And I still always wake up in a sweat. Sometimes um, there was a show on HBO. I forgot the name of it. Uh, Mikola, I can Mikola, I, the actress. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. Michaela Cole, he, I will destroy you. I, yes. Uh, that Remember, she was like, she took the deal, had the money, but didn't have the, <laughs> the project, right? And it's still always a, a nightmare of mine. Like, it's, it's like the nightmare you have of waking up in your, in, in your, pardon me, in your dream that you're, you still didn't complete college or high school or something because of that one mm -hmm. class. And you're going to have that <laughs> for the rest of your life. I sometimes have the dream that I took this money and I, I owe them. They're like, where's the book? And I got nothing. <laughs> Right. And so, you know, I always tell people like part of success is to know that you will sign contracts and you are legally bound to churn out some books and you have to give them. And so that is a real driver in some ways. Right. Um, in another way, uh, there's still stories and things I want to tell. There are still uh, bits of culture. I'm, I'm still that old like the Afrocentric guy who was like, I want to show you this bit of culture that you might be unfamiliar with or this history that you might be unfamiliar with, but I want to couch it in this different way. There's still a lot of that drive. And this, and at the end of the day, the art of the, I think what I always say is any writer is the love of storytelling, right? Like I said, I am the writer. Uh, <laughs> if I could, I would sit over each person's shoulders or reading my books and say like, what do you think of this part? Do you like that part? What about that? Did you read that? <laughs> <laughs> like my wife purposely, when she reads, she hides. Like, I don't want you asking me. Like, did you did you get the page <laughs> and so forth? So, I think as long as I can still maintain that that like mm -hmm. interest in telling a story and thinking in my head, oh, I bet people must have really liked it when they read this part. Oh, I hope they got this. I think as long as I can maintain that, that has to be my my biggest drive still, right? Um, mm -hmm. That these stories that I'm telling resonate with folks uh, and that they enjoy them, whether it is just for fun or whether they come out of it uh, like they've learned something or it's something profound because they see themselves. So for instance, I was in France and it just so happens in my, in the dead gen world, 
I basically have where Armenia is an independent nation and the genocide didn't happen. And I met this mm-hmm. young Armenian woman. She was like, she thought I was brought to tears. She said, uh, cause I just never thought I'd ever see anything. I never thought of it myself. And I never thought I would see something like this in a book, right? Where imagining it just never happening. And so that kind of stuff, like the fact that, you know, I didn't even think of it that profoundly as I did it, but that there are ways that your book can impact people. Those kind of things will keep me writing. Yeah, mm-hmm. Definitely. And then when someone calls you a successful author, how does that make you feel? Weird, but I mean, <laughs> it's weird, but I think I, I, I accept it because I understand that it, it took me a while. It took me a while, for instance, to... I remember somebody would say, stop calling yourself an aspiring author or stop calling yourself mm-hmm. a writer and just say you're an author. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was like, really, I was like, oh, wow. I didn't, cause I would say like, I'm an aspiring writer or something like this. I was using both wrong. <laughs> just, <laughs> um, and it, it's still surreal because I suppose the way it happened mm-hmm. just seemed like, it seemed like I was watching it happening while it was happening, but I was like, oh, it's happening to me. And so it is weird still when I hear people say that, because I don't, I don't feel like those writers who have like the perfect signature. My signature is still horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a fancy signature. I don't. I still, I still kind of don't understand all the market. I, I, I can't pay attention to all the drama that happens within. And so, so much. it's so much drama. And I was like, I'm not. Like you try to tell me what race fail is to this day, my eyes will, my eyes will glaze over. I, I still, I, it's like no, don't even try. Uh, <laughs> And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just weird. But I said, I understand because if I was looking at myself from the outside in, I would say, okay, you, you got published, <laughs> right? You, right? Your books got recognized. You won some awards. Like, like uh, Leslie Penelope wants to interview you. you. You must be a successful author. And so I'm like, uh, it's, 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 it's still strange. Um, but I accept it. In a, in an in the awkward way that you accept something like that, <laughs> right. where like when people call me to do workshops, I'm like, you want me to do a workshop on what? On how to write? How to write? I don't know how I write. <laughs> Just write, <laughs> right? And so, you know, it's still strange, especially when I, I see there there are people I guess I consider like like uh, um, Daniel Jose Older or Max Gladstone or N.K. Mm-hmm. Jemison, like they can give a master class, right? You can sit down and they'll give boom, boom, this is how I do it. And I'm like, yeah, those people to me are like successful authors who understand uh... the crap. And it feels to me like I'm still trying to figure that stuff out. But, mm-hmm. you know, I guess success is relative in its own way. Even yeah, and it's certain concrete meanings. I think all compliments can be difficult to take in that way. Do you think that you have imposter syndrome? Oh yeah, of course. (laughs) I think, yeah, that's a, I I always, you know, the old, the old saying, you know, that you see the old saying, the the Twitter saying, or did you have social media? uh, God grant me the, um, what is it? The, I forget. Confidence of a mediocre white man. man. (laughs) Like I said, I'm still, I'm still kind of there. Yeah. I, I still, wonder like is this story is actually that good I, I i still yeah i think i have it both in my academic and my i have it on my both my writing on my side that's like i don't know i i guess it's on the one hand i can be confident in certain things i do but i guess it's always healthy to have some sense of um not being overconfident uh that mm-hmm. what you're doing is always going to be well received or people are always going to be on the same page some people are not gonna like your stuff Right. right now, don't don't please don't tag me in your reviews when you don't like it. I don't, I don't understand why you. Do that. It's, it's ridiculous. Please don't. Um, but yeah, I think that imposter syndrome. How about you? Do you do you have any, or are you like I'm over that? I know where I am. I mean, sometimes I feel like I have split personalities. Mm-hmm. It's that thing of being a writer where yes, everyone needs to buy this, and it's wonderful, and it's yeah. great, and I'm proud of it. And also, don't tell me you're reading my book because I have no idea if it's good or not, right. and I'm constantly afraid. It's like you have this dual, mm-hmm. this duality of the double consciousness that's always happening. So wow. yeah, I, I I know I'm a good writer. Like I'm confident about that, but mm-hmm. also every time I sit down to write, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. How did I do this? 
all of these other times. I can look, people are like, how many books do you have? I'm like, I don't know, like 15 or something. And they're like, how do you write that much? I'm like, I don't know. Like, how do you write it? How do you write another novel? Like, I don't know. Just do. <laughs> I literally started the podcast so I could like record myself going through the process because I forget each and every time. Right. You know? Mm. And it, I, I listen back and I'm like, oh, okay. So this thing that's happening, I went through this in every single book and I conveniently right. forgot it. The, the middle falls apart. I have no idea what's happening, even though I've plotted the end. Like, yeah. So I have imposter syndrome, but also I'm insanely confident that I'm writing really good books. <laughs> that's, see, that's good. You have to have that confidence. I think you do have to have the confidence in your own work, that your work mm -hmm. is good in the end. Um, and you can't like let one reviewer or one person like derail you in that sense. But I think it's also, I don't I think every writer has to have a bit of, I hope it's good, as a bit of nerves on how yeah. it's going to be received generally. You know, but you talk about impossible. I guess my imposter syndrome is more so like you're talking about how you get it done. Definitely mm -hmm. around that. Because people ask me how, I still have a sloppy, I write down notes where I can, I, I have them on my phone. <laughs> and then I like, where was, I was on a short book, a speaking thing with um, Danielle Clayton, you know, like super writer. And showed me, Danielle showed me how she <laughs> organizes. It's like you ever go see this person like you think you're organized and you go in and they are, I'm talking, pulled out the full storyboards with oh. umpteen like colorful, uh, I don't know how many colorful tabs. And she's like, how do you do it? Uh, I, I use my notes feature. <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, it has it so like you're talking about, especially doing a series, has it so well where I'm like, Am, am I dialing it in? <laughs> this, this is, <laughs> yeah. This is the complexity that I want to figure out how to do. So you talk about a challenge. I would love to know how to do that level of complexity where, you know, I'm I'm so immersed in that I, I I can spread it all out there on the wall and people can mm -hmm. you know, come in a room and it looks like I'm doing a conspiracy thing, but it all fits together. I I don't I don't have that. And that when I start feeling imposter syndrome, when I see like people who I guess I consider they're very successful, not just successful, but they're talented. They understand the industry, understand the craft so well. When I see mm. them doing all of that, <laughs> I always yeah. say like, I got to bring my A game up because <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, the way like they are, they are weaving stories, the way they're doing this so complex. And me, I'm kind of like, I'm just figuring it in my head. And I got, I got little <laughs> notes every now and then that I, that I write, right? That's, that's good. That, that's like, why I think the imposter syndrome type stuff uh, steps in. Yeah. And I feel like, yo, I'm not. <laughs> like my sausage, everybody, everybody, how sausage is made is always, you know, it's always not glamorous. But I was like, mine isn't even complex. <laughs> I, need, <laughs> I need to leave behind something that people can, you know, come back and look at my notes and be like, well, notes. look at that. Right. Really put a lot of thought into this, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that when I read Lainey Taylor's books, it's mm -hmm. like, she's an author who I read her and I'm like, I don't know why I'm writing. Cause I, I will never be this good. Yeah. Like, there's certain authors who you're just like, my brain doesn't work that way. I oh, definitely. Uh, who is it? Uh, I had Dawn Johnson, like her oh, books. Oh gosh. Are, I love books. Like yeah. when I read them, I was like, what in the literary? I can't, like <laughs> I said, your, your book is like, it's like prose poetry of the highest like like a dance like yeah. like how these like i always it's funny you say that i told my wife i said she said what kind of books do you know i said the books i enjoy i enjoy a lot of different books i enjoy books that are fun i said but the books that i enjoy the most are the ones i know i could not write yes um the writer seth dickinson for instance he has these the oh. um the coromont i think it's uh, the i forgot the trader baru coromont those books such complexity I could, like I was like, my my mind could not, I can't see myself sitting down and plotting out stories with this multiple perspectives, this complex. I just, mm -hmm. I just can't. I know what I can do and it just doesn't feel like I can do this. And, you know, same thing, like, like I can't see myself writing like, uh, like the fifth season in case I'm mm -hmm. just like, no. Just so like, imaginative. Like how, yeah. how is that done? Right. And so, yeah, those are always my favorite type of books. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, they also give you that imposter syndrome. <laughs> so I guess it's like a weird way. I like that it gives me the imposter syndrome, but uh, I also enjoy them. Yeah. It can push you because I feel like I read Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo and I was like, I yeah. want to write a heist. And then I wrote a heist. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. If my heist is not as good as hers, but I wrote a heist and I did it. And I put, put the challenge to myself. Which is, I think, which is, it's just so important, I think, for 
anybody who is an aspiring or even an author writer is that you have to read. Um, yeah. And I, I sometimes, there's a time when I go back to my comfort food. For, for instance, Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. Mm -hmm. I have reread Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan maybe a dozen times. Are you serious? Yes. Them books. Wow. Them no wonder, because you were like feeding by when the show, I mean, the first season, yeah, and you're just my, a wealth of information. Like I read them, but like, I don't remember anything. <laughs> I've read them so often. It's like, I would feel like I grew up with Rand and Gwaine and Perrin yeah. and Matt. It's like, oh, no, I grew up with them in the two rivers. Yeah, I mean, they hang out, hang out in two rivers together. And so, but that's my comfort food in a sense. So whenever like, I don't feel like this is the politics or something in the sort, or I just need to chill out, I'll read them or I'll listen to them like the old audiobook ones and yeah. I'll fall back in that world. And it's great, It's but I have to remind myself don't do that because I'm not reading new work. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I'm not reading so what's out there. And there's so much out there. I'm not keeping up. It's just like in the academic world, you have to keep up with the literature, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, like I always tell people like, yeah, that's as an academic historian, you don't take a book from like 1920 something and be like, oh, look, which is, you know, what the old Afrocentrics <laughs> would do. They'd have a book from 1920 that was all their sources. I'd be like, well, what have people written about it since then? What's the literature? Right. And so yeah. much is the same um, with uh, writing. I think you have to keep up with the literature. Like, what are people writing? What's the new stuff? Like you said, like, well, what's yeah. out there? What, I mean, just to be frank, what's your competition? <laughs> Yeah, right? Yeah. And not in competition in a negative way, but a competition in the sense that other people are reading books, right? They, they, they have the choice to make of like, I'm going to read your book. Or I'm going to read this other book. And, you know, what are you putting out there? And so, you know, I had to remind myself and I, I tell this to people all the time. You've got to keep reading. Mm -hmm. Like um, you have to keep reading so that you know what's out there so that you can. So it jogs your own imagination. There's nothing like you just said, there's nothing like reading, whether it's short stories, novella, novellas, no, there's nothing like, or listening to audiobooks. There's nothing like that stuff to jog my imagination. I will, I will come back after reading or going to a con and listening. I'll come back with all kinds of ideas, right? It doesn't, and people say, well, it doesn't mean you're stealing. No, you're not stealing anybody else's ideas. I said, I said, that's I always told me that's like the, I've been kind of it's a sign of the amateur writer that you're going to, mm -hmm. trust me, we're all pulling from each other in some shape, form, or fashion. I'll let somebody know. I'll put in and I'll say, like, I was influenced by when you did this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Ed Cattails, Kaya Shanti Wilson's uh, books, mm -hmm. right? Like, definitely it was an inspiration for what certain things I did in Dead Cattails. And I said, you know, but it was reading that stuff that jogged the imagination where your imagination starts over and you said, I was inspired by this and this is how I'm going to do this in this completely different way. And so that's why reading, reading is fundamental. Old riff, we're all people of a certain age, you know what riff was. Uh, <laughs> but um, reading is absolutely necessary if you're going to write. I just, you know, people are like, well, I don't want to read because I might end up stealing their idea. Come on, man, just, just read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just so you understand, it helps you understand pacing so well. It helps you understand the structure of. It un helps you understand what sounds what not to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So read. It's it's very helpful. Yeah, and I find I can't write if I'm not reading. If I go too long without reading, my well dries up. So yeah, yeah. Why well, start for me? I'll start sounding like Robert Jordan if I then I <laughs> default. Start, you know. 22 pages telling you how someone's dressed and I said, I is the kind of dress they have on. And you don't want that. <laughs> I, mean, I, love, I love his books, but you don't, you don't want that. Right. <laughs> that was good for its time, but yeah. Yeah. We're, we've moved on. We've moved on. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. It's no, been thanks. Really awesome. talk for Saturday really afternoon. Like it. It's uh, chill. And, yeah. Oh um, yeah. One of my biggest takeaways from talking with Fenderson was that notion of meeting your obligations, whether they be contractual, your day job, your family, your own creative desires, is always a balancing act. What if success was as simple as finding balance? Or as one listener wrote me a while back, instead of balance, maybe we call it harmony. Awards, reviews, certain milestones can be fleeting. Once you get them, what else can you do but strive for more? But working for harmony between your career and your life, between the stories you want to tell and those that will sell, between your art and your business, 
maybe that gets us closer to an idea of success that is sustainable and actually nurturing. If you're interested in learning more about P. Jelly Clark or reading his work, I have links in the show notes. You can sign up for the footnotes newsletter, which includes the show notes for each episode, as well as weekly inspiration, strategies, and ideas to help you grow as a writer and a creative. That is at myimaginaryfriends.net slash footnotes. When you sign up, you can choose to become an imaginary best friend for a few dollars per month and get access to premium posts, quarterly workshops, as well as discounts on my courses and coaching. Next up in the interview series, I speak with Kelly Armstrong, an author who's been publishing for decades. She's lived the ultimate dream of so many authors and has come out on the other side with some amazing Zen-like perspectives. If you don't want to miss that, make sure that you are subscribed. And until the next time, keep imagining.